start, there are some officials we want to acknowledge and thank again for their on, ongoing support. Senator Jay Costa, I've seen you. And Representative Dan Frankel, I think I saw you. There he is. Um, help me, is there any other elected official? Oh, Tracy. Oh, and she doesn't have her uh, yellow tag on, it's at home. And do we have any one elected official on Zoom? We have many and um, Salim has the list. Well, these are elected officials. We're beginning to oh, the I'm candidates. Sorry. And now some deep. Pardon me. Oh, yes, Abigail Salisbury. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now some details about the how the afternoon will proceed. Each candidate will have two minutes to speak and four minutes to answer questions. We realize it's a short time, but we want to keep the meeting in about two hours. But you'll find it all very interesting. Our timekeepers, Cindy and Kathy Smith, will indicate to each candidate when their presentation has 30 seconds left. And then again, when the candidates, the candidate has 30 seconds left to finish their questions uh, and answers. A stop sign will be shown when the candidate's time is up. Those with questions are asked to pose questions succinctly. Members on Zoom may ask questions in the chat room. Voting by eligible club members will begin at four this afternoon and complete and will be completed at nine. So make sure that you do vote between four and nine on OPA vote. Preferential voting among members determines the club's endorsed candidates. You'll hear more about what constitutes preferential voting at the end of the meeting. There's an information sheet that has been distributed. It addresses our support for free speech and also the need for us to complete our work today. We ask that you step outside if you are engaged in conversation and stepping aside means so far out that we can't hear you because it's, it's a distraction. We thank you in advance. We may have to ask you to turn off your cell phones if the internet connection isn't strong enough to support Zoom. We had a major problem last year, but we believe it's been fixed. And candidates, make sure we have your preferred email so Karen can let you know later tonight of the endorsements. Her email is k. H O C H B E R G at me.com. Again, K H O C H B E R G at me.com. And candidates, when you're on Zoom, when you sign in, please put put candidate after your name so Julie knows that you're a candidate. And before we begin. I want to add a personal note. We celebrated the clubs, the club last night and the work it's done for over half a century. We stand on the shoulders of Janet Kreisman, the Barons and many others. We honor them and carry on their ideals today as we make our endorsements. Our first candidate is uh, Celine, do you have? Well, she ha she has this. I can't. Um, we have Jack Stolsteimer via Zoom. Mr. Stolsteimer, are you available? I'm here. Yes, thank you. If you'll start again. Okay, well, 
Good afternoon, everyone uh, in uh, the 14th Ward. Sorry, I can't be with you, but uh, sometimes my day job as a district attorney of Delaware County gets in the way of me being able to campaign as much as I'd like. Uh, and that was the point this weekend. Uh, our state police organized a resource fair for people with autism and neurodiversity issues uh, and also included a strong component of law enforcement training so that we can better serve all of those people in our community. Uh, and they really needed me to be there yesterday. So I was proud to be with our state police and law enforcement here. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, that's why I'm really running for attorney general, because of the work I do every day as the district attorney of our Commonwealth's fifth largest uh, county. As you probably know, the Attorney General is, under Pennsylvania law, the Commonwealth's chief law enforcement officer with the responsibility to supervise uh, the investigation and prosecution of thousands of criminal cases every year. Again, I do that work every single day and am uniquely qualified in this field, both to win the general election for us, but also to serve as Attorney General day one. You can learn a lot more about the work I've done here in Delaware County as a district attorney. I'm the first Democrat ever elected district attorney, at least since the Civil War. Uh, I was elected four years ago. But please check out our website, jackforag.com. We kept it simple so that even I would remember it. Uh, but you'll see that I've been able to balance criminal justice reform. I've lowered the prison population in Delaware County by 40 percent after working to deprivatize the, the Commonwealth's only privately run. Excuse me, prison. sir, you have 30 seconds for your presentation, and then we'll take questions. Okay. Uh, and I've also reduced gun, vi gun violence in the city of Chester in Delaware County by 68% over the last four years. I'm also the only candidate in this race who's used his position as district attorney or as any elected official to oppose the Dobbs decision before the U.S. Supreme Court to uh, start the first environmental crimes unit in any district attorney's office in Pennsylvania, and to actually fight wage theft, which is why I've been endorsed by the Allegheny County unions, uh, both at the AFL-CIO and the building. And now we'd like to take some questions from the audience, both here and via Zoom. I can't travel to you. I don't see any questions. Hold on, we have a question coming. Okay. Um, mm, there's a couple things I think about. There's a broad range of issues that I think the Attorney General has authority over. Um, and, and my understanding is that district attorneys handle um, criminal and other kind of cases in their district, and you handle larger statewide issues. Um, yes and no. So, yes, no. yeah, well, so th there's a couple things. I, I'm really interested in about reproductive rights and abortion care accessibility in Pennsylvania and how we're going to protect that. And I'm also really interested in the school funding case that the court made a terrific decision on and the legislature's done nothing. And what can we do to um, address the inequities in funding in public? What can the attorney general's office do to force um, some resolution? Sure, well, first of all, you know, Attorney General Josh Shapiro and I stood together to protect women's reproductive health in Delaware County or in Pennsylvania and also here in Delaware County. Uh, he and I filed a legal brief before the U.S. Supreme Court to oppose the Dobbs decision. Uh, when that decision came down, taking away uh, the national right to a women's reproductive health, uh, I took a personal pledge here in Delaware County that I will never prosecute a woman for violating what I know to be her constitutional right to reproductive health. Uh, that's very important to me personally. My mother came to this country as a 15-year-old Ukrainian refugee from a Nazi slave labor camp, but she died in childbirth with me. So I know firsthand how important women's access to reproductive care and ability to make their own decisions about their own bodies is. Um, the court decision, uh, Liz, that you talked about, the Commonwealth Court decision is groundbreaking. Uh, and the Pennsylvania legislature is now for the first time meeting this year I'm beginning the work of trying to determine how they can meet that constitutional standard now to provide fully funded education to everybody in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. There will be years, if not decades, of litigation yet to come, because whatever the legislature decides and how much they're going to fund and how, uh, somebody will want to go to court and say that that's not meeting the new constitutional standard. 
my job as the attorney general is going to be to stand in the shoes of the children uh, and to fight for their rights before the courts. Uh, so I will look to see what the legislature actually does on this issue uh, and the governor's office as well, and then be prepared to go into court and make arguments about why our kids need the best opportunities possible to succeed in this life. Thank you very much. We have another question. Yes, ma'am. Hi. How does white collar crime stack up am amongst being tough on on crime in general? <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. Uh, you know, the white collar crime, uh, you know, is is sort of out of control. Especially, you know, this internet we're talking to you through right now. Uh, is both a super highway for communication and commerce, but also for crime. Uh, so a lot of what we're finding out we have to do in, in law enforcement is get more tools in the toolbox and make sure that we can fight white collar crime. Uh, a lot of it is Mr. taking- Mr. Stonelight Steimer, you have 20 seconds left. Okay, well, I can't answer the rest of that question in 20 seconds. So why don't we move we on? We understand, yeah. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate you. your presence here today. Our next speaker on on Zoom is Mark Mark Pinsley. Welcome, Mr. Pinsley. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. And can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, so my name is Mark Pinsley. I'm running for Auditor General, so not Attorney General. Uh, I am Jewish, so I do appreciate that Karen spoke about the 1619 Project, as we need real history to be taught. Uh, in the general election, we're running against a gentleman named Tim DeFore. He's, he's mild manager. He doesn't appear to be MAGA, although he's financed by Jeffrey Yass. And before becoming an auditor, uh, auditor general, he was Dauphin County Controller, and he was the auditor for healthcare company before that. So to compete against him, I have my MBA in finance. I have my undergraduate degree in finance. I have managed multi-million dollar budgets. Uh, at, mil at multi-billion dollar companies. And I am currently the controller of Lehigh County, which is just like the Auditor General, except at the county level. So I am the only one in the race that is currently doing the job of Auditor General. And I'm the only one in the race that has flipped seats from red to blue. I've been using the controller's position to advance the cause of the people, not the powerful. Uh, I audited the county health care where the spend, we spend about $30 million a year on our employees. And I found $9 million in savings, which we brought back to the citizens of Lehigh County. I ordered the prison phones and I found for every dollar a prisoner spends on a phone call, the county is getting a 70 cent commission. So last year we made $750,000 off of the backs of prisoners, really their, their loved ones. And then when the Dobbs decision came out, I called on our commissioners to divest all $145 million out of Wells Fargo because they were donating to anti-choice candidates and move it to a nonpartisan bank. The board actually voted to start that process. These same things can be done at the state level. We can show financial impact of underfunding our school systems. Excuse me, Mr. Pinsley, you had 30 seconds left. Thank you. We can lead the way on reforming health care by showing massive state savings. The state spends over a billion dollars in a year, and we can show that the cost of our largest nursing home, uh, our state prison, can be done better. My candidacy for Auditor General stands on a solid foundation of financial expertise, practical expertise, and a proven record of delivering results. I believe the role of Auditor General requires a deep understanding of financial matters and a commitment to transparency. Thank you. My name is Mark Pinsley. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Mr. Pinsley? Hold on. We have someone coming up. You have to speak quiet. Um, thank you for uh, divesting from Wells Fargo over issues of abortion. Do you support divesting from fossil fuel companies um, over climate change? Thank you. Oh, wow, what a great question. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is not, obviously there's going to be a path you know, from fossil fuel companies to better energy, green energy sources. But yeah, anything that we can start to do to reduce um, money going to fossil fuel companies, I am for. Any other questions? I, I have one, um, Mr. Pinsley. How 
what are the obstacles to full LGBT participation within the Commonwealth? Oh, I mean, there's so many obstacles. I don't think that you could just uh, state one. Uh, the, what we can do in our office is review how people, you know, how companies are, are uh, what they're doing with LGBTQ issues in general, and then make a note of that in our reports. We don't necessarily have any specific impact that we can have uh, financially, but the goal is to use money to show the impact that anti-LGBTQ issues are having on the Commonwealth. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate everyone's time. Our next candidate is also joining us via Zoom, and that is Ryan Bizarro. Mr. Bizarro, welcome. Hey, how are you? Thanks for having me today. Sorry, I'm not able to be there in person. I'm actually in my car right now on the other side of the state, but uh, I appreciate you uh, giving me this opportunity to be with you today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Ryan Bizarro. I represent the third district up in Erie County, and I serve as the majority policy chairman. And I'm proud to be part of a leadership team that helped create the first democratic majority in more than 12 years. And today I come, uh, I come before you as, as the Pennsylvania Democratic Party's endorsed candidate for state treasurer. Um, look, I want to be your straight treasurer. I want to create uh, impact investment funds. I want to create a real estate infrastructure fund, and I want to expand the 529 plans. All of this can be found at teambizpa.com, where you find a uh, complete uh, overview of what I'm proposing to do as your next state treasurer. But I want folks to understand that this is more than just a race for state treasurer. This is a battle to help curb extremism here in Pennsylvania. The current treasurer, Stacey Garrity, is Pennsylvania's most highest ranking row office official that Pennsylvanians have ever accidentally elected. And I say accidentally elected because she only won by 52,000 votes in 2020 by 0.7%. Quite frankly, we can't give her a second term. She uses the treasury not to do well for Pennsylvanians, but to, uh, to, to, to stoke the flames and, and further the political divide. It's unacceptable. I'm running because I want to do the job and I want to modernize the treasury. And if you give me the opportunity, um, I will do that. Uh, I'll keep it short. And I just respectfully ask for your, uh, your endorsement and, uh, and your vote. Thank you so much. And I'm happy to take any questions. Any other questions? Yes, we have a question. We may have two. Um, my question really is, and it's partly because I don't follow the treasurer that closely, is you mentioned that the, the person who has it now has uh, has divide, has used uh, the position to divide us. And can you just give, excuse me, give me some examples? Sure. Uh, before the, uh, we, everybody knows what happened in Washington, D.C. on January 6th, right? On January 5th, uh, Stacey Garrity and Doug Mastriano had a major um, rally at the Capitol, rented buses literally instigated an insurrection and sent those folks down to Washington, D.C. And as a result, we saw what happened. She has been the lead surrogate I'm pretty for Donald sure. Trump. I mean, first of all, he's answering the damn question. Why does she actually say you only have 20 seconds left? That um, made no sense. Hello? I mean, it really didn't. That was hello? really rude what that lady did. You know, you but I think the, yeah, the yeah, lady's yeah, just Yeah, rude. you just She's have just to wait good. a minute. Huh? He's huh? I think somebody cut in in the middle of my. Yeah, um, they... Do you want me to continue? Yes, I'm sorry, please. I don't even... Okay, all right. Well, then they sent those folks to Washington D.C. And, and and you know what happened from there, right? We yes. had one of the we they almost overthrew democracy. She is the lead surrogate for Donald Trump when he comes into town, um, and and that, that's it. She endorsed him already. She didn't need to. She could have backed away from him, and she continues to embrace him and his, and his Trump policies. We can't have that. That has no business in state government, particularly Wonderful. in a row office. Wonderful. Thank you. That that clarifies a lot for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Is there another question? I thought I saw a hand raised. OK. All right. Are there any other? Qu yes, I believe so. There is another question. Um, as the state treasurer, what uh, do you feel the office can do to help take advantage of the Inflation Reduction Act and other um, 
chips and the bipartisan infrastructure law. Thank you. Well, I think we have to be ensuring that we're investing in companies that are um, American companies. That's first and foremost. Um, that's going to be key. That's going to be a, a big part of what the treasurer's office does when I'm treasurer. Um, you know, uh, there's a reason why labor from across the Commonwealth, particularly in Allegheny County, have supported me and endorsed me overwhelmingly uh, because they know I'm about uh, jobs first and, and, and putting uh, putting our workers first and investing in them. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Thank you very much. We appreciate you calling in from the eastern part of the state, Mr. Bizarro. Thank you so much. And I would appreciate your support and endorsement. Thank you for the opportunity today. Certainly, certainly. Bye-bye. Yet our next guest, our next candidate is also via Zoom, Jared Solomon. Welcome, Mr. Solomon. Hi, how's everybody doing? Very well. Thank you. I'm Jared Solomon. I'm a state representative in Northeast Philadelphia. I'm chairman of Veterans Affairs and Emergency Preparedness, and I'm running to be your next attorney general. I'm running because in the 2024 election, our rights are on the line. Our rights are at stake. We all know with Trump as the Republican nominee, he comes with all of his extremists right here to Pennsylvania. And they're going to be threatening our most fundamental foundational rights, the abortion access, voting rights. We need an attorney general with the courage not just to take on these fights, but the courage to win. I get my fight from my mom, a special education teacher, single mom who raised me above my great grandparents' butcher shop. And I took that fight to revitalize my community, bring community pride back to my neighborhood. I took the fight in my professional career as a securities and antitrust lawyer to large corporate cheats to make sure we held them accountable. I took that fight to special interests in Harrisburg through bills like my bill to rein special interests in, bringing a gift ban to Pennsylvania. And I fought for my country in the United States Army as an officer there, and now serving- Mr. Solomon, you have 30 seconds left. Thank you. As an officer in the National Guard. When those Trump extremists come to Pennsylvania, we need to fight back. For instance, when those folks bring hate crimes to Pennsylvania, on in the first month in office, I'm gonna form an anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, racism, bigotry task force that uses the tools we have that acts as a mobile response team to push back and condemn animus towards any groups, and then explores new tools, like finally bringing a hate crimes law to Pennsylvania. Thank you we very much. We're gonna take some questions now. Any questions on Zoom? Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Solomon. We very much appreciate your Thank you so much. Oh, here, I'm sorry, there is a question. Please. I just feel like we should ask similar questions we've asked other folks. So I had a two-part question. Um, I, I, I want to understand what you as uh, the Attorney General would be able to do to protect abortion rights and reproductive health care rights. Um, across the Commonwealth and from people coming in from outside the Commonwealth. And I also am interested in the recent um, school funding uh, court decision that came out of, I think, Commonwealth Court. Um, I, I'm fearful that the state legislature, as long as there's a Republican majority in the Senate, will not act to implement the decision. And I want to know if the state attorney general has any authority to force action and a decision in that case, a movement to implement, a re to revise the funding system to make it more equitable for all students. What's your name? Liz Healy. Hi, Liz. Thank you so much for the question. Um, protecting abortion access, safe abortions in Pennsylvania is gonna be my number one priority. And I've stood in the legislature with my colleagues to push back against Trump Republicans attacks on abortion access time and time again. 
And also I've developed what's called a women's health care compact in the legislature. This would allow us to join with like-minded states in Maryland, New York, and New Jersey to create a bulwark to protect abortion access, but also to make sure in a positive way to provide resources in the form of transportation costs, hospitality costs, to make sure that women are welcome here to Pennsylvania. And under, in, in my role as attorney general, I will make sure that Trump attorneys general from other states will never, we will never honor the discovery motions, the subpoena power coming in from those states to Pennsylvania. We need to always be on the lookout of any kind of Texas style tactics coming here to Pennsylvania. In terms of the um, landmark William Penn education system, this is our rallying cry. All of us need to come aboard because the Supreme Court finally convincingly said that education is a fundamental right. And we've also, through the School Reform Commission, School Basic Funding Commission, we know how much it costs. What I will do as your next attorney general, because I have oversight, sign off on contracts that we push out, I will make sure that every dollar coming out of that landmark decision goes to our educators and our kids. That is what I will make sure to do as your next AG. Thank you very much. I don't see any other questions, so we appreciate your appearance. Thank you, Mr. Solomon. Thank you. And now I'd like to call upon Senator Jay Costa to share his thoughts with us. Thank you very much, Shane. I appreciate the chance just to come by. Uh, first and foremost, to say thank you for all the support that all of you collectively in this room have provided me over the years. I love my work in the Senate. I'm running for re-election and want to continue to do the good work that I think represents the people of not only our 43rd district, but across this Commonwealth. I've had the privilege of serving as a Democratic leader for 12 years now. And in that role, I've been able to do many things as it relates to preventing many of the things that folks are talking about as it relates to some of the things on women's reproductive rights. We've been at the forefront of fighting back on constitutional amendments and other pieces of legislation. Election security, 2021, when my Republican colleagues, Chris Dush, tried to subpoena 9 million records of Pennsylvanians. Two days later, we were in court. And finally, I'm happy to say, two, three, almost three years later, Supreme Court agreed with our position and did not permit them to have access to those records. Those are just some of the things that we've been able to do over the course of the past several years. I was raised here for many years, more than 30 some years of my life. My family lived in Squirrel Hill for over 50 years, an all rice product. And I really believe having the opportunity to represent this community is something I truly enjoy. So thank you for the chance. I'm not sure how much time I have left, but I'm happy to answer any questions. I wanted to run through that before I'm happy to answer any questions that folks might have. Any? Yes, sir. So, Jay, what, what would it take to get control of the Senate in Pennsylvania? Yeah. Thank you very much. There's a number of things that we can do. I'm glad you asked that question. So we are three short, three seats shy. Uh, we have three opportunities across Pennsylvania. Through the redistricting process, I was able to uh, establish a seat, the 14th district in Lehigh County, we heard from Mark Pinsley, and also another seat in Dauphin County, the 15th, which we should be successful this upcoming year. State Representative Patty Kim is a tremendous candidate. She should likely win that race, and she's going to do outstanding. We have a race up in Erie County, uh, the 49th district, which we made about two points better. It's about 53% performing district. We think we have an opportunity there. Here in Allegheny County, the 37th district is the 50 50 seat. Uh, currently seated is Ro Devlin Robinson, um, but we have a great candidate uh, in Nicole, uh, Nicole Recito, who is a school teacher, comes from a family of school teachers. She's a coach. She's a mom. She's a husband, wife, you name it. She's got all the things that we want in that district. That'll be a battle, but that gets us to 25. We also have to protect two seats here, the 45th district. Uh, Nick Piscitano is a house member running in the center of Jim Brewster's seat. Through redistricting, I was able to um, 
keep out Westmoreland County. My colleague lost Westmoreland County by 6,000 votes. Uh, so we start, you know, now we're 6,000 votes better because I took completely took Westmoreland out and gave up some of the Mon Valley community. So we should be successful there, but that's an open seat that they're challenging. And finally in Berks County, uh, Judy Schwank, a, a longstanding Democrat, actually who went to school here. She's from Alderdice, grew up in Square Hill, tremendous colleague. Um, Berks County's changing, and but she's someone who's going to be able to hold on to that seat for us going forward. So that's how we get to 25. And I assure you, all the things that our colleagues in the House have sent to us, I assure you, Lord willing, we will vote on them every single day we're in session until we get them across the finish line. When you look at the list of things, so that's what we need to be able to do. Thank you. Thanks again. I really appreciate all the wonderful support. Thanks, James. Thanks for letting me. Sorry to mean to let you do it. And now we're going to hear from another local candidate, Abigail Salisbury. Hi there, my name is Abigail Salisbury and I'm the incumbent for State House District 34. Uh, I'm currently interviewing to have another term as uh, the incumbent for <laughs> State House District 34. Um, I have only been in office for a year now. My focus has been to really create a capacity building effort in the district. I represent 13 different municipalities, uh, one of those being the edge of the city of Pittsburgh and then extending over to East Pittsburgh up to Wilkinstown. So we have a real income inequality issue in the district. We have parts of my district where the average annual income is $129,000, and we have areas where the average income is $29,000. We have areas that are quite affluent and regularly get money from the state. We have areas that are in, to be very frank, dire straits and are experiencing severe blight, uh, up to 50 to even 90% vacancies in some wards of certain parts of my boroughs. So I've worked very hard to unite those 13 different municipalities by holding intermunicipal cooperation meetings last year and this year, doing grant writing training for every municipality that wants it, and focusing on distributing over 450 bound manuals of every grant that is available from the state of Pennsylvania throughout the district. I've also founded the Nonprofit Caucus prior to being in this office. I'm a nonprofit attorney, and I was on Borough Council in Swissvale for five years. So my emphasis is really on creating capacity to go after foundation and state dollars to to bring those into the uh, communities that I represent so that we can work on issues like infrastructure so that we don't have another borough building that falls down like Swissvale or another bridge that fails like Fern Hollow Bridge or another one that gets shut down because Norfolk Southern won't fix it like the Washington Avenue Bridge in Swissvale. We need to work together and we need to build capacity in order to lift up all of these communities together. Thank you. Are there any questions for Ms. Salisbury? Yes, we have one. I've heard a little bit about this, but can you speak about some of your advocacy with respect to autism and other uh, potential disabilities? Oh, sure. She asked about um, advocacy for people with autism and other disabilities. So um, I'm the first Jew to serve in this House seat. I'm the first LGBTQA openly identifying person to serve in this House seat. I'm also the first person with autism to serve in this House seat. So um, it's something I used to try to hide and mask, which women with autism tend to be better at um, and is kind of a coping mechanism that I've engaged in for many years now. But I said, maybe there's a certain point in your life where you just let it go and you're just going to be you and that's what we're going to do. So I was diagnosed with Asperger's um, and which is now rolled into the autism spectrum. And I feel that for those of us who have the opportunity to engage in activism around um, autism, because we're at the point where one in 56, it's estimated children in Pennsylvania are starting to get diagnosed with autism today. There was a vigil a couple of weeks ago in Pittsburgh for children whose parents killed them because they had autism. Um, so I've tried to be a vocal proponent for 
acceptance. Um, and, you know, it is called a disability. And for some people, th that is how they experience life. For some people, it can be a superpower because um, there's a reason that I can rattle off the income statistics of every community in my district. And it's because I visualize the map in my brain that I ask demographics to produce. And so I can tell you that $22,000 a year is the median income of Braddock. Um, so, you know, I know that 80% of the 14th ward has gone to college, but only 8% of the 13th ward has gone to college. And they're right next to each other. You just walk across Penn Avenue and the, the world changes for people. So sometimes it is a superpower, but we also have to remember that people are discriminated against for being neurodiverse and that is not acceptable. And we have to make sure that we incorporate everybody into a future of Pennsylvania. Thank you. That was quite stirring. Um, any other questions? Oh, we have, we have one. Hi, Abigail. Um, so uh, this is, I hope it's not too technical for most people here, but with regard to low income housing, the state is, 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 has been funding non income based lower income housing for tenants, but for poorer tenants, income based subsidies are what's required in order to house uh, tenants in an affordable way. And I'm wondering whether you have uh, been involved in address, trying to address the issue of having the state fund income-based subsidized housing for poorer tenants. So uh, I actually just hosted a policy hearing in Rankin Borough to talk about affordable housing and blight. There should be no one in our area who is homeless when we have uh, vacant homes. And so there are areas that have been vacant for 40 years. So if things can't be fixed, then we need to tear them down and we need to rebuild things that people can actually live in. If they can be remedied, then we should. I helped somebody get a $1.5 million investment to work on affordable housing and home would. I hope to do more of that across the district. And we have to do more with the rent rebate program, for instance. We just did that. In many parts of my district, people can get $1,000. Thank you again, Ms. Salisbury. And now we'd like to hear from Congresswoman Summer Lee. Thank you. So six years ago, I came before you all about uh, school and housing issues, which we've been able to partner with uh, Secretary Fudge to bring and create uh, millions of dollars for affordable housing. We've come here uh, lifting up the experiences of the most marginalized while making sure that we're fighting for every single community that we have. And this year, I have experienced what I think is a, a first term, a ha first half a term that I believe everyone in this community can be proud of. When we talk about the $1.3 billion, there are going to be some people who kind of try to convince you that a Black woman could not accomplish that. But the reality is, is that those are competitive grants, and we got them because we worked hard, because the team that we put together worked day in and day out to serve everyone in our community. We've been able to bring home millions of dollars, not just uh, through the resources, but into your pockets through the thousands of people we've served, helping them with everything from their uh, housing to uh, Social Security and Medicaid. I've been on the front lines of fighting back as a member of the Oversight Committee and ranking vice ranking member on both of my subcommittees because my leadership believed in me and understood who they needed on the front lines to fight. And I've carried that fight with me and everything that we've done. I'm proud of what we've been able to accomplish. And I'm ready to continue to build the coalition, not of the past, but the coalition, the only coalition that can win us, not just in 2024, but beyond. Thank you, Congresswoman. Do you believe that Israel is committing genocide in Gaza? She asked if I believe that Israel is committing genocide in Gaza. I think that words are often only important if we all have the same understanding of them. But I will say what I believe is happening with Israel. Benjamin Netanyahu, thank you. Please allow me to talk. No, 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 you're not actually. You're not allowing me to talk. You're not allowing me to speak.
Thank you. What we're looking at and what we're seeing uh, through Benjamin Netanyahu and his politics and his policies are incredibly concerning. I would say unconscionable. 30,000 dead civilians, all infrastructure in Gaza has been destroyed. And right now, of the two million people who live there, over a million are in Rafa right now where he is threatening to cross even President Biden's red line. So I think that we have to be very serious about the international laws that have been uh, that have been run afoul, that, have, that they have uh, actually broken. They have absolutely Absolutely broken international laws. We know that because he said it, because they have said it out loud, and every human rights organization in the world agrees. Not just me. We also now have colleagues of every single race, uh, background, and ideological perspective who have called for a ceasefire because they have seen and heard precisely what each of each of us are. I want to say that I have colleagues who went to Israel. They are Jewish. Some of them are moderate, and they went just a couple weeks ago. And they spent however long they went there and they were able to speak to Netanyahu and they were able to see on the ground what there is to be seen. And as soon as they landed back in the United States, they called for a ceasefire. They said that they are convinced that Netanyahu is committing an ethnic cleansing. And they immediately said that how he's conducting this war, it, war is unacceptable. And I agree with them. Thank you, Summer Lee. Oh, I have to come forward? Okay. <laughs> Don't pull the mic. All right. Thank you, Summer. I, I really appreciate um, your courage, honestly. But what I want to say is ask about, actually, is the speaker before, Abigail Salisbury, was talking about the blighted areas here in Pittsburgh. Uh, Abigail, Abigail Salisbury was talking about a very important part of living in Western Pennsylvania, which is that there are areas that are blighted. And I was just in Braddock. I went to an incredible play there, uh, but we need help. So I wanted to know what you can do for us. Thank you for that question. It was about blighted communities. I was actually thinking about when uh, Rep Salisbury was talking about that. I am from the borough. I'm from the borough in that district that has the highest rates of blight. I'm from the third ward of North Braddock where I grew up uh, next to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of houses that have been left behind, that have been destroyed. There are many pro programs that we can invest in both at the federal and the state level. When I was a state rep, I was proud to be a, a huge supporter of the whole home repairs program, for instance. It's a program that invests money into homeowners uh, so that they're able to fix things like their roofs or their infrastructure issues. We know those big infrastructure things that keep people from being able to stay in their home, to be able to keep building generational wealth. And it helps us to remediate blight because when those houses, if you lose a roof and then you have to move out, we know that that house is more likely to, to turn into blight. Also, so we are working right now to make sure that we have that at the federal level because it is an incredible program. We were able to secure over $50 million for, uh, from HUD and even more to start to build a affordable housing. So we have places like Bedford Dwellings in the Historic Hill District that's been historically divested. Uh, this is not just going to be an injection into housing that is appropriate uh, for people in that community, but it's also going to uh, cause and spur an injection of other development that is community-centered, and we can replicate this and fight for even more dollars uh, for other communities around the, uh, the, the, the uh, region for that. I know you're doing a tremendous amount of work for people in poverty, but I also know that you've also done some work and some heartfelt work for, for those in the Jewish community. And I really wish that you would spend some time on the work that you've done there with Tree of Life and others. Thank you. I'm going to reclaim some time because I did get interrupted. Uh, I will say that that is absolutely true. I'm proud to partner with, with Senator Casey on a, disarm, on a Disarm Hate Act, a bill that would, if you have committed a hate crime, ensure that you can never have a weapon of war or a weapon of mass destruction like we saw play out here in Pittsburgh and at Mother Emanuel in South Carolina. We worked in partnership with the 1027 Healing Project to bring home dollars to build out their facility and their center that will center not just on anti but on all of the forms of white supremacist hate that we need to educate our region on. We were able to push that over the finish line and we're proud of that work. But all of the dollars, the 1.3 million billion we brought home is because of the partnerships that we built, the coalition that we built. We talked to, and I wanna be clear, we've talked to people on every side of this conflict, every part of the Jewish community, from the Jewish Federation to the JCC to the 1027 Healing Project, uh, up to J Street, and if not now, we talk to the families of hostages who I hate to regret to inform you, do not always believe everything that some of us who in this room do. We've also talked to Muslims and Arabs and Palestinians who are our neighbors, who have suffered tremendous loss. 
they've suffered tremendous loss and they don't often have people who will even speak to them in their political process. We will, because when you represent this community, we represent each and every corner of it. And we're proud of the ways in which we've built with each and every corner of this community. Thank you, Representative Summerlee. We have someone in the uh, waiting room on Zoom, Malcolm Kenyatta. Welcome, Mr. K Kenyatta. Thank you so much, and I appreciate the opportunity to be with you. My name is Representative Malcolm Kenyatta, and I'm running to be your next Auditor General, but I want to talk about why I ever ran for office in the first place. Um, I was raised in a working poor family in North Philadelphia. My dad was trained as a social worker, my mom as a home health aide. And I have seen all too well what happens when government services work and deliver for families who are struggling, who are in desperate need of them to work, and when government doesn't. My parents divorced when I was young. And so what that meant for me is I lived six different places by the time I graduated high school. Got my first job at 12 years old, washing dishes at a little vegan soul food restaurant. And I came from a family where we needed LAHEAP to keep the utilities on. We needed SNAP benefits to, to, to have food on our table. We needed access to affordable housing, which I've heard so many of you talk about. And that's why I'm running for Auditor General, because the one role in state government that's about finding ways in which government isn't working or could work better, better and then bringing people together to fix it. And I think my time in the legislature and the priorities that we have laid out make us uniquely qualified to win this race. And I know that I'm short on time. I want to defer to your questions. But I do want to say that when you look at every single union who's endorsed in this race, without exception, everyone has endorsed our campaign. Nearly every Democratic controller across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania with you know a noted exception, has endorsed this campaign. And that is because of the time that I've spent understanding our state budget, fighting for a lot of the priorities that I'm discussing now, and doing a lot of the gig of the Auditor General from a legislative perspective, providing that legislative oversight as somebody who's been on the Commerce Committee, where I chair the Subcommittee on Financial Services and Banking, on the uh, Finance Committee, on the Judiciary Committee, on the State Government Committee, where I chair the subcommittee on government up. operations. Thank you. So I'm ready to do this. Okay, thank you so much for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Kenyatta? I know it's a little difficult via Zoom. Anyone in the chat room? I can hear you just fine. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Kenyatta. I have a question. Well, well, thank you. I appreciate. It. Oh, there was a question. Okay, I just, I just wanted to say that um, I, it, it seems like the auditor general role is not quite as visible political position, that, and 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 you're such a mm -hmm. articulate speaker and and passionate about about things, and it seemed like you'd be better off in a more political role. That's just how I visualize your, you know, your progression through this process. And so, auditor general seems like a Maybe you can explain why that's, uh, you know, what what's what would you bring to that to your skills? What would what would be relevant for that? Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you for that, Danny. And Danny, you know, I've had people say to me, you know, Malcolm, you're, you know, the auditor general's role. That's so boring, you know. And I'd like to say, with all due respect to some great previous auditor generals, we've had a lot of boring auditor generals. But the job itself is not boring, and I promise you, uh, we'll we'll fix that. The auditor general is not only the state's. Uh, watchdog, um, but it is the public advocate. If you, everybody knows uh, Tish James from, from New York, the attorney general, prior to that role, she was the New York City public advocate. And those are effectively, if you look at the job descriptions, they're effectively the same. But I've spent so much time in Harrisburg um, fighting for budgets that actually prioritize the least among us, um, that make sure we invest in, you know, all the different things that we need to invest in and make our communities work. And we have an auditor general right now who is, A, an election denier. We have Republicans who are insistent on making, um, on, we have uh, Republicans who are insistent 
on putting the auditor general in charge of auditing all future elections. And we have a current auditor general can't even accept the results of the last election. We have to rebuild the Bureau of School Audits, which I pledged to do on day, day one, create a new Bureau of Labor and Worker Protections. And because of that commitment, my 100% labor voting record, as I mentioned, every organization in labor period has endorsed our campaign. And then we have to use this office to really lift up best practices all across you know, the Commonwealth. Um, I understand that in going into this role, I'm gonna be standing on the shoulders of some, you know, some giants, including our, our Senator, uh, Bob Casey, who had this job. And I think we have an opportunity to use this role in an innovative way to speak up for people, to utilize the bully pulpit and to be, and so, you know, effectively take a look back at all the budgets that I've uh, helped pass and to make sure those dollars actually result in the outcomes that I hoped when we passed them. So I appreciate the question. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kenyatta. And I think we're going to take a 10 minutes. I appreciate minute... it. Take care. Thank you. Oh, um, we're going to now hear from Keir Gray Bradford, who is running for Pennsylvania Attorney General. Well, thank you very much. My name is Keir Bradford Gray. So thank you for getting all the, the names right, but just in a different order. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here to introduce myself. I am running for attorney general because I know that Pennsylvania needs a fearless, courageous, visionary leader that can use the roles of the law to tackle the challenges of today head on. Almost 50 years ago, I was born to two proud parents, union working parents, that I watch fight against adversity just to provide me an opportunity to compete. Yes, we lived in neighborhoods that were impacted by violence, but I also saw inside of my house how structural violence really helped or perpetuated our lack of opportunities. My mom and dad were very, like I said, they were very proud workers. My dad fought for healthcare and equality. My mom fought against employment discrimination. It was only until a lawyer came in and treated them with the dignity and respect that they deserve, went into court, used the law to protect them, and I saw, hey, there's a new way to make sure that people are protected, and that is the legal process. So when I got a chance to go to college, as the first to go to college in my, in my household, I said, I want to be a lawyer because I want to use the law to protect families like mine. And as I got out and became a lawyer, the first in my family, so proud, I became a lawyer and I said, hey, I'm going to fight on behalf of the most vulnerable. I'm going to fight on behalf of those who are disposable to a justice system. I became a public defender and I fought in both state and federal practices. And it gave me an understanding and awareness of how much I would say structural violence, inequalities have created some of the most desperate things that we're seeing. And as the Attorney General, I will use all of that insight and understanding to make sure that I target crime where it needs to be and where it's not. We need to make sure that we hold some of the old people, the retailers, the suppliers, the manufacturers, just as accountable as we do as a kid on the street corner making stupid decisions. There's a lot of blame and accountability to go around, and there's a lot of people that haven't paid their fair share. But when you have someone like me, that knows how to use the law, that knows how to understand issues, I will serve this role correctly. <laughs> Environment, come on, bring it to me. <laughs> Speaking of accountability, we know that Exxon has lied to the American people and had a concerted disinformation campaign for the past 20, 30 years. And cities and um, areas across the state are encountering um, a lot of costs from uh, climate change. Pittsburgh has a mitigation bill of around $520 million. How do you see using the Attorney's General Office to address that? Well, we're gonna tackle anyone who violates our right to clean air and water head on. I mean, there is there is so many ways in which the Attorney General's office can do this, using the law, using the investigatory tools, and using our civil protections. But also, in, 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 in conjunction with what you're saying, I want to talk about really quickly the civil protections that we have. Because as a woman, I want to use the law to make sure that we protect women's rights, fundamental rights. The role of the Attorney General protects our constitutional rights to live, to be free, to love who we want to love, to worship where we want to worship, to make sure that we have the decision for our own bodies of what to do when we are faced with the peril of having to say, hey, I may die here. 
African-American women are five times more likely to die during childbirth. And it's a shame that when they're opting for other areas and access points, that they are not given the insurance coverage to do so. So when we're talking about looking at these roles and righting the wrongs and straightening inequities, we're talking about environmental justice. We're talking about health care equity and access. We're talking about housing stability and making sure that people are not being price gouged out of their own neighborhoods because we're not regulating the market. But most importantly, we're talking about financial security securities. There are far too many people stealing money out of your pocket, fruit from off your table, and roots from over your head, and getting away with it. You saw Josh Shapiro when he sued banks for denying people access to wealth. Well, what about when we see people stealing right from people's pockets, price gouging them out of meaningful things that they need? Rob Casey gave us an opportunity to give state attorneys generals greater, greater authority in this area with the anti-price gouging bill. That is going to allow us to make sure that when you go to your pump and you're still paying $5 because they haven't brought those prices down, the attorney general can take, take a look at that and see why that's happening. When you go and look at insurances, but they're price gouging those insurances up because we don't know any better, or we don't know who to turn to, the attorney general is going to take a look at it. And we're going to have community regional coordinators to hear what's going on in every major city. And when you have healthcare institutions that are posturing as nonprofits for giving a service delivery that is not as robust as the nonprofit law requires, but their compensation packages are going up, the attorney general will take a look at it because we are here to make sure equity is advanced in every meaningful way. And that's why I am running. As the chief public defender of the fourth largest criminal defense firm in the country, I learned a lot of things, and I know how to use the law in a lot of ways. And the worst thing they could have done was give me a law degree because I'm going to use it for a lot of people. And I want to make sure, as your attorney general, you will not forget this role for what it can do because it's been underutilized for far too long. I want to thank you so much. I think there's other hands, but I don't know how much time I have. Thank you. I've worked on that. And when I was, when Josh Shapiro appointed me, okay, school to prison pipeline. Josh Shapiro appointed me to be the chief defender of Montgomery County. And what did I do immediately? I looked at when we were getting kids that were coming to the justice system for things, yes, there's a statute of limitations that I did when I was a kid. And if I were to live today, I wouldn't be able to be a lawyer. So we work with the school district to say, hey, why are these kids, black and brown kids, with I, what we call IEPs, when they have some, some learning disabilities? They're not getting that, but they're getting tossed out of school on discretionary practices. I'll quickly wrap up. I created youth forums in that school to make sure that the behaviors that go on in school that can be taught in school so kids can grow out of those are done in a therapeutic way. And those forums that I created in Montgomery County made it to Pittsburgh. But guess what? I did it for free. You guys are paying about a million dollars. However, <laughs> I will make sure we bring all of those models to make sure kids have an opportunity they deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Great. I think I'm going to just, we'll postpone for just one more candidate our break because Aaron McClellan, who's running for Pennsylvania treasurer, treasurer, is running and we give deference to statewide candidates because of the area that they have to cover. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Erin McClellan, and I am running for state treasurer because there's a traditional idea of what this office looked like. But after Joe Biden came in, the level of reforms he's made has completely changed the game. And as I was watching the other two candidates run, I didn't see either of them jumping on these opportunities. First of all, Joe Biden created a mission driven banking program through the FDIC. This is capitalization and framework to put small community banks back in, uh, in, in inner cities and rural communities where they don't have access to this. There's money there. We are missing that because our current treasurer won't do it. I support ESG ratings on our investments, environmental, sustainability, governance. If there has to be more, if we're going to infuse value into our coffers, then we need to do it at looking more than just the bottom line. I support a savings program statewide that is not the Keystone Saves program, which both my opponents support. That is a scam. I call it the George W. Bush Great Recession Starter Kit. It is unregulated, unregulated in any way, shape, or form. And the SEC said that those types of programs, self-directed IRAs, are highly susceptible to fraud. 
I also want to go back to how we were investing pensions before George Bush deregulated them in 2003 and decided it was just fine to start putting money into commodities, aka oil stocks. Just because the government now says we can does not mean that we should. I also want to do a, a Finance 101 program for women and girls. I think it's really important for empowerment to uh, teach young women about the importance of their finances. So that's my base platform, but I have a lot more that I want to do. So I'll be happy to take any questions that you have. Okay, I'll bite. What more do you want to do? <laughs> Well, uh, a new phenomenon in the Republican Party among state treasurers is to use pension money. Now, 43% uh, of your coffers is the teacher's pension alone. We have three, teacher, three, three state pensions. This new thing where we use teacher's pensions to invest in conflict overseas so we can make divisive political statements needs to stop. Absolutely needs to stop. That is not what that money is for. That's our teacher's retirement. That's our state worker's retirement. Both of my opponents have come out publicly and said they supported doing that. I do not, and I want to stop the politiz politicization of this office and dividing our party on issues that are controversial in ways that are completely inappropriate for an honest broker in the treasurer's office. Anything else? Um, it's pretty impressive all the things you said you'd like to do, but do all of those things that you say you'd like to do, are they within your authority as the treasurer to unilaterally d impose? Yeah, the, the issue of the savings program, that's up to the legislature. Uh, that passed the House. Uh, it has not passed the Senate, and the Republicans say they're not going to run it. Um, but so basically that would be legislative, but I want to stop the savings program. So I want to fight against that and I want to educate the people on exactly how bad that program is so we can stop it. It looks like that's already starting to happen with the SEC. Uh, the mission driven banking program that goes directly through the federal government. So and that's a framework and capitalization that comes from there. We don't need legislation uh, doing a public bank, which is something else I'm interested in that that is I want to lead the charge on that. It's a heavy lift probably require a constitutional amendment, but the opportunities, $1.6 billion in just our class one townships alone. Now they are not being serviced well by the too big to fail corporate banks. If we can create a public bank, bring those deposits in, we can give them better interest rates, we can provide them better service, and most importantly, we can provide them cybersecurity. The National Association of State Treasurers has said that the state treasurer should take on cybersecurity. The Aliquippa Water Authority was hacked by Iran, Chester, lost $400,000 at a phishing scheme. And the Washington County infrastructure was shut down for more than three weeks on a ransomware attack that cost them $350,000. That all has to stop. That falls on the state treasurer. That's another thing that she's not doing. I want to get into the communities, all 2,659 uh, municipalities in this state, and give them support. In Aliquippa, they got hacked for one reason. They were using a default password that came with the system that was... <laughs> One, 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 one. So we're just gonna start at the bare minimum here, but our municipalities really need our help. And everywhere I go, no matter what party they're in, they're saying, will you help us? We'll give you, you give the resources of that office that secure your $163 billion and teach them how to do it themselves. Anything else? All right, I, I thank you all so much for your time today. As an Allegheny County resident, it was so nice to only drive 25 minutes this morning. So thank you so much. I would really, really appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you. I have to keep you for one more statewide candidate, Joe Kahn, who's running for Pennsylvania Attorney General. Thank you for being so patient. Good afternoon. I'm Joe Kahn. I want to be your next attorney general so that I can continue my 24 year fight to keep Pennsylvania safe, not just from crime, but from corruption and attacks on our rights. First and foremost, though, I'm a proud parent of two kids in the Central Buck School District, where we just kicked the Moms for Liberty out of my kids' schools. And long before that, 
I was a public school kid growing up in Northeast Philly. Why Northeast Philly? Because in the 70s, my parents got together and you had a Muslim dad and a Catholic mom. The only place that would take them in was a Jewish neighborhood. So I went off with my great public school education to the University of Chicago to get my law degree. And I met a young professor who had the same background. Dad was a Muslim immigrant, mom was a Christian American. And he too had spent his whole childhood feeling different than everyone else. He helped me understand that having to navigate every conversation of my life, bridging cultures, wasn't gonna be a handicap for me as a public interest lawyer. It was gonna be my superpower. My professor's name was Barack Obama. Because I had him in my life, I was able to come home and start a 24 year career standing up for my community as a prosecutor, first in the district attorney's office and then the US attorney's office, fighting not just crime, but corruption. That's why I started a new career in civil justice, taking on corruption in the corporate boardroom, going after opioid companies who caused devastations in communities across Pennsylvania. And it's that corporate accountability work that brought me to Bucks County, where I continued that mission, but took on the work that I think is most at stake in this election, which is defending our rights. I was the first and only county solicitor to use my office to defend access to the abortion pill, I was the first county solicitor in Pennsylvania history to enforce our constitutional right to clean water. And when Donald Trump tried to take away our votes, I didn't just stand up for Bucks County. I united county solicitors from Allegheny to Philadelphia and everywhere in between. And we fought Trump all the way to the United States Supreme Court and we won. And that's what's at stake, my friend. I'm Joe Kahn. With your help, I'll be our next attorney general. Thank you. Uh, similar question for you. Exxon has been lying to us about climate for years. Sorry, Exxon has been lying to us about climate for years. And now Pittsburgh is going to face about $520 million in damages due to climate change that has been denied. What are we going to do about this corporate malfeasance? Thank you for your, thank you for your question. Um, as your attorney general, I'm going to be accountable to all of you. Hopefully you support me. I will be accountable to those who didn't vote for me. But most of all, I'm accountable to my kids. And someday they're going to look at me and say, Dad, what did you do to keep us safe? What did you do to leave us with a better planet? And that is why I'm running. Now, you have some great competitors in this race to choose from for attorney general. And all of us are going around Pennsylvania asking for help. And we hear the same thing again and again. We don't want to choose between Democrats in a primary. Well, I couldn't be more proud to be the candidate that has the support of environmentalists all across Pennsylvania. Clean Air Action did what it has never done in a Democratic primary, which is to hold up a candidate as a champion of environmental justice. I am not only the candidate who has enforced our constitutional right to clean air and clean water, but I have a vision for restructuring the environmental crimes unit in the attorney general's office to become an environmental justice unit, to not just put polluters in jail when we should, when they pollute our environment, but to go after government itself when it fails our people. So to your question, joining the fossil fuel litigation, that's the low hanging fruit. That's the first thing we're gonna do because Pennsylvania should not just be part of this fight. We should be a national and a global leader on climate change. Article one, section 27 of the Pennsylvania constitution, our environmental rights amendment, it is a superpower for an attorney general who has the experience and the vision to use it. That's why I'm running for attorney general and I thank you for your question. Thank you. So what, what can you as the attorney general do to enforce the uh, recent Supreme Court, PA Supreme Court decision which essentially held that all uh, Medicaid recipients have a right to use Medicaid to, uh, for abortion care. Thank you. And thank, thank you for that question. Um, if you haven't done it, I will spare you having to see the Republican attorney general debate. There are two prosecutors, and let me be clear, I not only have the most experience as a prosecutor in the Democratic primary, I have the most experience of any side. The Republicans are gonna to talk tough and tell people that you need to vote for a Republican if you want safe streets, right? You in Allegheny County have heard this before, right? But the reason they want this office is to roll back our rights. And the Republicans have a fundamentally different view of the Pennsylvania constitution that we just mentioned, which is going to be our firewall 
from the Trump appointees on the U.S. Supreme Court that want to roll back our rights. They can't overturn the Pennsylvania Constitution. In my view, the Pennsylvania Constitution guarantees reproductive freedom. And that is not just my view as a, someone who understands constitutional law, who learned it from a pretty good professor. Right? I will be unflinching in enforcing it. My mom, who uh, taught me the stories that inspired my career prosecuting sex crimes, talked about the women she treated that came into her ER. She started her career before Roe versus Wade. And so I learned about the importance of having access to safe abortion care, which she told me about a young mother with a boy about my age who tried to get an abortion that wasn't safe and was rushed to her ER and bled out in her hospital. Right. So we have the power with the attorney general's office, whether it's through Medicaid issues, whether whether it is protecting people who are fleeing to our state to find safe haven, to get access to abortion care, to use this office to enforce that right for all Pennsylvanians, not just those who live here, but those who may be visiting it. That's my view of the Constitution. And that's my view of the AG's office. Thank you very much, Mr. Cohn. We, so we appreciate that. Um, unless there are strong objections, I'm going to suggest that we just move on through. We have only three more candidates. So rather than move, oh, okay, I, there's great support for that. Um, our next candidate is Eugene D. Pasquale, who is running for Pennsylvania Attorney General. Eugene D. Pasquale, and I want to be your attorney general. Grew up five blocks from here. And I'd like to believe that some of the values I learned in Squirrel Hill about looking out for one another helped drive my career in public service. Part of that was some tough investigations. It was my investigation that found over 3,000 untested rape kits. But working with my team, we brought justice to victims. It was my investigation that found 58,000 unanswered phone calls at the child abuse hotline. Any single one of those calls could have been life or death for a child. But it wasn't enough for me to just find that problem. We traveled to every single county to make sure our kids were better protected. But I also have a personal story that connects with being attorney general. See, my dad was wounded in Vietnam, was prescribed synthetic heroin by the VA that led to a 30-year battle with addiction. He was eventually incarcerated for that. So I've seen both sides of the most failed war in the history of the United States. And that's the war on drugs that must be turned into a battle against addiction. I also know what it's like to struggle. Some of you know my brother, Anthony, when he passed away as a sophomore at the University of Pittsburgh from muscular dystrophy. We never had health insurance. We had to take out loans to pay for the funeral. My dad had to come to the funeral in shackles. That's why I will fight these insurance companies, these corporations, to make sure we all get a fair shake. And also, before we had been our oldest, we had an ectopic pregnancy. The decision we made that day would land us in prison in Oklahoma. I want to be clear. This fight for abortion rights is personal to me as it's personal to you. I will protect it for every single Pennsylvanian and for anyone leaving one of these right-wing authoritarian states coming here. They will get equal protection as well when it comes to their abortion rights. And I also know how to win. I've run statewide twice before and I've won twice, including once when Trump was on the ballot. I'm going to take my political, personal, and professional experience to be your attorney, to protect our democracy, protect our environment protect reproductive freedom, and take on the crooks trying to scam our seniors every single day. My name is Eugene D. Pasquale, and I want to be your attorney. Looks like I nailed it right on the time. In the interest of fairness, I would... Uh... What would you do to process environmental crimes? It is a great question. And people, you know, first of all, ask, what are your priorities? First of all, it's protecting democracy, because if we don't have that, that's that's the whole ballgame. Then after that, I've made it clear it's abortion rights and climate change. And when it comes to climate change, I've already taken action on this. The first investigation I did as your auditor general was investigating the Marcella shell drillers, using our constitutional right of clean air and pure water to take them on to make sure our drinking water was better protected in this state. Also, all those solar panels you're seeing going up, homes all across Pennsylvania, I don't know how much you travel. When you're running statewide, you travel a little more than most. Well, that started in 2008 with the Alternative Energy Investment Act. That was my legislation, helping consumers save money on their utilities and helping protect our environment. And I also did the first ever 
audit of the cost of climate change here in Pennsylvania. So I've already taken action on this. Now, specifically, when it comes to the question, what are you going to do? Look, we have a right, constitutional right to clean air and pure water. We can, invent, we can convene an investigation basically on anyone to try to get the information we need to find out if we can actually take legal action. Now, I can't prejudge what that investigation will be. I want to be clear. But I'd be shocked if they don't already know and haven't known for decades what they're doing to our planet. And if that, and if that is the case, I will hold them fully accountable. I was on the Orioles, by the way, if that's a question. Squirrel Hill Little League. I know that. I know that. Oh, yeah, I was on the. I, sometimes that can cause a little bit of a, you know, because we were, you know, that was that was a controversial one. So. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, the question is, what am I going to do on the education funding that has been ruled unconstitutional? First of all, when I was in the state house, we passed the largest increase in public education dollars. And in the 2010, it led to every subject matter tested and then every grade tested improvement. So dollars do matter. Now, Orbit set us back decades. Now, what can I do as your attorney general? I can't force the legislature to act and pass an equal funding bill. But what I can do is if they pass something that doesn't pass constitutional muster, I can sue them and force them to go back to the drawing board again. I want to be clear again. I can't force the legislature to act. But if they do act and it's not constitutional, I can sue it and force them to go back because every single kid in Pennsylvania has a constitutional right to a thorough and efficient public education. And that's what I'll fight for as your attorney general. That, that is, I would say yes, because the first prong of this is, is getting the legislature to act. They actually have a, had a commission on this that showed we're underfunding public education. I think the number was about $7 billion. Was that the number, Dan? It was about that we are underfunding public education by $7 billion. So that means they've got to find over the course of the next several years about $7 billion to make sure every kid gets an equal shot. If they don't do it, I'll hold them accountable. Does the attorney general play a role in uh, enforcement of the right to know law, which is very weak in this state? So the short answer is, if there is a crim, the question was, do I have a role when it comes to the right to know law? If there violent, if there's a willful violation, the answer is yes. So if it is a technical they made a mistake. That's the Office of Open Records. If there's a willful violation, I know that gets into legal jargonese there, but if there's a will, willful violation, then I can. And yes, it's horrible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have a Zoom question for him. I'm sorry. There's a Zoom question. Um, okay. What is your stand on gun control? I don't believe, well, first of all, as attorney general, I get to enforce all the laws of the state. Now, having said that, I've taken a position we need to have universal background checks. No civilian should have access to military style weapons. We need to crack down on ghost guns. We also need to go after the dealers that are selling these guns illegally, hold them accountable as well. And also, if and when we find information that shows us that these dealers are making guns that they know are dangerous, we can hold the corporations making these guns accountable as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we're going to hear from Representative Dan Frankel, who's running for the House 23rd District. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Jane, and thanks, uh, thanks for sticking around. Um, first of all, I want to thank all of you for uh, not just your support of me over so many years, but for all the work that you've done uh, to help elect Democrats in this state. Uh, what a difference an election makes. Uh, I am serving in the majority. Uh, thanks to a lot of the work you did here in Allegheny County, flipping two seats. And, and, and what that meant was that 
I now serve as the majority chair of the health committee. I spent four years in the minority fighting abortion ban after abortion ban, anti-vax legislation, uh, bad science, uh, attacks on trans kids, uh, one thing after another, attacks on the University of Pittsburgh for doing its biomedical research. That stopped last January when we were sworn in as a Democratic majority. You did that work. We thank you. The other, the other thing that's happened this year is things that I and we have been working on for years together have moved forward for the first time. We passed in the House of Representatives with Republican votes the Fairness Act which provides equal rights for all Pennsylvanians, including our LGBTQ and disability constituents. For the first time, it's over in the Senate. We passed three bills to address gun violence and sent those over to the Senate. We have the opportunity uh, here, and you, you heard from Jay earlier, we need to elect a majority of uh, Democrats in the Senate to get this done. So we have work in front of us. Uh, but there's daylight, and I think that the work that uh, we have seen uh, take place uh, by House Democrats uh, is really quite, uh, quite exciting and gives you a sense of what could be done if we get a trifecta in Pennsylvania, a majority in the Senate, reelect that uh, Democratic majority in the House and with our uh, Governor Josh Shapiro. So thank you for all you've done to help make that happen. Questions. So uh, my legislative priorities, a, a lot of them uh, are in uh, the House Health Committee. So one of the things that we will be considering very shortly uh, is uh, a uh, improvement, uh, an expansion of the Clean Indoor Air Act, which was passed in 2008, to make sure that there that all employees and people who patronize venues like our casinos have the opportunity to have a healthy environment in which to work, in which to recreate. Uh, we have been falling behind the rest of the country in terms of that. So that's a bill that we have passed out of the House Committee on a bipartisan basis, I hope to move. Uh, other legislation that I've been working on for many years uh, that actually moved this year, uh, in the aftermath of uh, uh, October 27, 2018, uh, Senator Costa and I, uh, Mayor Ganey was also part of this at the time, put together a package of, of bills to update Pennsylvania's hate crime statutes. Um, we are in desperate need. It's been 40 years since we've done anything, and we've seen an epidemic of hatred, of violence uh, against groups of vulnerable groups across the board. Quite frankly, anti-Semitism has kind of gone off the charts. It's not the, it's not the only vulnerable group out there. We've got Islamophobia, homophobia, uh, xenophobia. All these things have generated uh, hatred and uh, acts of violence and harassment around the, the state of Pennsylvania. We need to be able to provide uh, our communities the tools to better be able to fend that off. Those bills, those four bills, we got out of the House with Republican votes, again, over to the Senate. I have some hope because I've had conversations with the Republican leaders that we may be able to have the opportunity to get uh, Republicans to bring them uh, to the floor of the Senate and get them passed. So, uh, Josh Shapiro has been an advocate uh, from the days when he was in the state legislature and a colleague of mine there. Uh, so I'm very hopeful that we be, may be able to get that done. Yeah. Here we go. Sir. What is the role of the Pennsylvania legislatures um, in um, dealing with the nonprofit status of the major health insurance companies. So there you go. That's a softball for me. I mean, ha having, having been probably fighting uh, our, our local uh, institutions, which are kind of emblematic of the challenges we have both nationally and statewide, the extraordinary consolidation that's taken place uh, in healthcare uh, and the integration that has taken place between our healthcare systems and the payers. So you have uh, UPMC Health Plan, UPMC, Allegheny Health Network, Highmark, uh, Kaiser uh, now is uh, taking over Geisinger. Uh, so this integration has created really uh, uh, extraordinary dislocations, hospital closures around the state, particularly in our rural areas. So it's affecting access to health care. And it is contrary to what a lot of people would tell you is that consolidation would bring down health care costs. It is increasing health care costs. Uh, so 
Uh, so we need to address that. One of the things that we need to do, and I had a hearing about this uh, with the current attorney general, is that we don't have an antitrust uh, statute in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, and it, it's, it's been a heavy lift to try and get that done. But one of the things we ought to be able to do is even if, if we can't get a broad antitrust st statute, is to get one that addresses healthcare specifically to be able to rein in the excesses that we see with uh, healthcare consolidation across our state. So we make sure we retain access, reduce costs, and get better outcomes. Three things that are missing from this whole discussion. Thank you very much. Um, I think for other questions, I'm going to ask uh, the questioners to to ask Representative Franco on their own. Um, I want to recognize Mayor Ed Ganey, who has joined us. He's long been a supporter of the club. Of the club. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. And now I would like to introduce Ashley Coleman, who is running for PA District 34. Good afternoon. My name is Ashley Comins. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of the 34th District. I'm a mom, I'm a wife, and a current school board director in Wilkinsburg. So a little bit about myself. 2016 happened and was a really eye-opening moment for myself, my family, and the future that I wanted to see for my community. I knew that just showing up and voting wasn't enough and that I needed to do more. So in 2017, my husband and I were newlyweds. I wanted to get involved and I decided to run for school board because I knew we'd wanna have children. I'd wanna send my children to our, our home schools, actually the same home schools that I got started in. And I knew to do that, I would have to get to work. So I ran for school board, went out, knocked on doors, met my community. And one of the number one issues that my community talked about was our taxes. Wilkinsburg has historically had the highest taxes in the county. We've lowered our taxes. We've been able to strengthen our elementary schools, completed a school renovation from the school that I actually attended. We have a very strong music program and added additional pre-K classes where my daughter is currently a student at Kelly Primary School. A little bit after that, my good friend Summer Lee decided to run for state rep. And at that time, I was like, OK, let's do this. Let's get into the movement. Let's pull more people in. I supported her. We ran that office. We increased engagement in the community. And we recognized that there was a belief and a value from the community that everybody wants to know that their schools are fairly funded. Everyone wants to have a livable wage. We want to have care infrastructure in our communities like paid family and medical leave and making sure that we're taking care of the people that we love. This has been a part of my work and the thousands of doors that I have knocked on to build the coalition that we have been seeing bring great leaders into this community, whether we're talking about the five women we elected to the Court of Common Pleas, we're talking about our new county executive, Mayor Ed Ganey, and sending Summer to Congress. This is the work of building power and community with the people, and that is something that I know this office has continuously shown an overwhelming support for, and I believe that this is the first primary and an option for the community to make their choice on who they want to represent them. Thank you. Could you point out any specific votes that um, Representative Salisbury has made that you would vote differently on? So this is a conversation or question in regards to votes. I believe that this seat in the office and the representation and the issues that impact the community are what's important and how we're going about serving those needs. So fighting to fairly fund our public schools, fighting to make sure that we have paid family and medical leave in, in Pennsylvania for families to take care of the people that they love, making sure that we are increasing the minimum wage. Those are the fights that are on us right now and requires more of us than just showing up and making a vote. That requires us to organize and mobilize not only in our communities, but also in Harrisburg. And that is the work that we must continue to keep doing. Ashley, what's the first bill you're going to introduce? 
the first bill I'll introduce? That is such a good question. Uh, something around fairly funding our public schools. I am a, a mom. I am a parent and as a current school board director, seeing the benefits of actually seeing additional funding come into a school district like Wilkinsburg has shown the success of what fairly funding, and it's still not fully fair, but we've received additional funds to make the accomplishments we've seen happening in Wilkinsburg, like our successful partnership with Pittsburgh Public Schools. We send our kids there, but we also have to pay for them to attend that school. We've received additional funding from the state to make that successful. And so if that happens to, to if that benefits a small school district like Wilkinsburg, where we're serving about a thousand children, what would that do for all students across Pennsylvania? So getting to the work of putting the money into our, our youth in our schools would be one of my first priorities in Harrisburg. Thank you. Um, would you support banning fracking? Would I support banning fracking? Yes, we must hold corporate polluters accountable. Living in a community like the 34th district, we have seen you know, the detriment that a lack of accountability on pollution has been for our community. Um, and I'll, especially as a mom, I have a almost two year old son who in this moment, I'm consistently worried about, does he now have asthma? And I know the, the reasons for that. So yeah, banning fracking, yes. And holding corporate polluters accountable is, that's, that's the nature of the work. And I believe uh, we've seen how having a bold leader stand on that continues to show that the community supports that and has been behind that. Uh, we have one more candidate, but before then, we're going to give you, Kathy Smith is going to explain the method by which the club ascertains endorsements, our preferential voting. Okay. Um, thank you, Jane. Jane asked me to explain preferential balloting because um, many years ago, I introduced it to the club from another organization. So the way our voting works is a candidate needs to have four, a minimum of 40% of the vote to win the endorsement. So we put in preferential balloting so that if a candidate, if the leading candidate does not have 40%, it's essentially an instant runoff. So when you vote, you're going to vote in each race, one, two, three, four, five, however many candidates are, you'll list your preferences in that race. And the way it works is this. Well, I'll give you an example of a four-person race. We'll call them candidates A, B, C, and D. So the votes are counted. The, with the first votes that are counted is everybody's first choice vote. And say in this example, no one has 40% of the vote. So then what we would do is look at who got the lowest number of votes and eliminate that person from consideration of the, for the endorsement. But their votes would then be reallocated based on each voter's second choice. And then they essentially get reallocated to the three remaining candidates. And then the votes are recounted. And if no one still has 40% of the vote, then we look at the candidates again. And the lower, the least, the person who got the least number of votes among the three remaining candidates is then eliminated and their votes are reallocated. So when the third round comes and the votes are reallocated, we would look at who, everybody who had that eliminated candidate as the first choice, we would go to their second choice. And if the second choice happens to be the already eliminated candidate, then we would go to that person's third choice. Similarly, there could be some ballots it, when we're in the third round, the eliminated candidate was the second choice of the first eliminated candidate. Is everybody following this? So in that case, also, we would go to their third choice. In other words, we would look at what each time we're redistributing the ballots, we're going to look at every ballot and see who among the remaining candidates 
is the person's highest choice until we get to 40%. If there's only two candidates remaining, we will get to 40%. Yes. Um, yeah, the question is, she doesn't want to put anyone anywhere. Um, keep in mind that part of the club endorsement, one of the votes is no endorsement. So no endorsement counts as a candidate. So if you have your first choice, and I've done this myself many times, your first choice is your first choice. Then your second choice can be no endorsement, and then you can go down from there. So if you're... But keep in mind also, if your first choice is somebody that you think is going to finish in the top two, your second choice never even gets looked at because your ballot doesn't move if your candidate remains in the top two. But yeah, you could do no endorsement as your second choice, just to make that clear, because otherwise your ballot isn't counted in the second round. But Correct. You can use no endorsement in the mix, just like a person. Okay. So everybody get that? So yeah. Okay. Any more questions? One other thing I should mention though, is if uh, somebody who's eliminated candidate um, didn't select a second, third, fourth choice, whatever we're on, um, the, when the ballots are redistributed, the total number is recounted to reflect the number of ballots still being counted. So um, that also could change the threshold needed to get 40%. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. I have heard, I've heard this explanation now three times. I've read it many times. Now I understand it. Thank you. I'm not, I'm not, not close questioning, please. So our last candidate to speak is Bhavani Patel, who is running for the 12th district congressional seat. Welcome, Bhavani. Got it. Um, uh, first of all, I just want to start off by saying thank you all. Uh, thank you to the club. Thank you all for taking time from your busy schedules to be here today to listen to all the candidates. Um, as mentioned, my name is Bhavani Patel. I'm running for Congress in Pennsylvania's 12th Congressional District. I announced my candidacy on October 2nd, and since then we've seen a tremendous amount of grassroots momentum all across this district. We've been working very hard, door knocking, phone banking, and meeting voters right on the ground. In the time that we've uh, announced, um, I've earned the endorsements of roughly 40 local elected officials, including mayors all across this district, the mayor of Monroeville, West Mifflin, Baldwin, Munhall, North Braddock, East Pittsburgh, as well as members of council throughout these communities. I'm also very proud to have the endorsements of several different labor unions, including the Steamfitters, the Teamsters Local 341, the Operating Engineers, as well as the Pittsburgh Regional Building Trades, and we anticipate growing our labor union support. I'm also really proud to announce that we hit a pretty big milestone with our campaign. We're actually running our TV commercials. We started last week and we intend on staying up on the air through the election day um, and, and continuing to share our message for change. When I think about why our campaign has garnered such interest um, and the positivity of why people wanna door knock and volunteer and push this uh, campaign forward, I think so much of it has to do with my story and my family's story. Uh, my mom is originally from India. She comes from a very small village, grew up in poverty, came to the United States with dreams and aspirations. She raised my brother and I as a single parent here. We moved around a lot growing up. She worked in the restaurant industry, washing dishes, various different other odd jobs, including working in the motel industry. We oftentimes lived in the motels that she would clean. Uh, and then we eventually arrived to Monroeville, uh, where she started a small uh, catering business, supplying pastries and samosas to the local Patel brothers. And uh, since then, you know, uh, we've, my family's been running a food truck business for the last 25 years. I was the first in my family to graduate from college, went to Pitt, then Oxford. And then since then have been involved in various different public service engagements, including serving on council, working for Allegheny County government, um, serving on the PA Medical Marijuana Advisory Board as an appointee of Senator Jay Costa. I'm running because I want to uh, push forward the promise of what this country has to offer for general election. Mm -hmm. We truly have zero margin for error. I don't think that being anti-Trump is enough. You have to be pro 
pro-President Biden. President Biden is one of the most, if not the most progressive and effective presidents that our country has seen. The Infrastructure Bill, the Inflation Reduction Act, the Chips and Sciences Act. I would have been a yes vote on raising the debt ceiling in July. I would have voted uh, with the majority of Democrats on that. What we have right now is somebody who voted with the Freedom Caucus on that one. I also would have signed on to the letter calling on Secretary Yellen to halt the sale of U.S. Steel to Nippon. I think that they're and we've learned this through our conversations in the Mon Valley, there were a lot of union workers who felt very concerned about being sold out through that deal. I would have signed on to that letter alongside Senators Fetterman and Casey, as well as Congressman Chris Deleuze. Deluzio. I will also say that when we think about advancing this region, we think about economic development, it's absolutely critical that we have somebody who's in touch and in, in present in the district. In October of 2023, we lost out on two different opportunities. One was a hydrogen hub and one was a tech hub designation. I would have been 100% behind pushing the tech hub designation. That was $500 million that was authorized through the Trips and Sciences Act that would have allowed us to invest resources and dollars to advance research and development for, you know, to address the climate crisis, renewable energy. We should be driving those conversations not here just in PA-12, but nationally and globally. We are home to Carnegie Mellon University, the University of Pittsburgh. We have talent here, young talent. We need to do everything in our potential to win designations like that. So young families want to come here. They know that when they apply for jobs here, that Pittsburgh, Western Pennsylvania is on the map and that they have a sense of upward mobility in their job in their job uh, professions. When we don't win those things, it has massive implications for economic development and getting young people to come back here. I'm one of the people that came back here after getting my master's degree at the University of Oxford because I believe in the promise of this region. This region built, allowed my family to do the things that we're doing today. It means a lot to me, and I think that we need to continue pushing that forward. Speaking of President Biden's crown achievements of the IRA chips and IFL, one, what would you do to get the word out to more people in the area about how they can take advantage of it in their lives and their houses and you know cars and stuff? And then two, um, what would you do to help address the gaps uh, of allowing people of lower income and lower capital to take advantage of? We're sorry, there was a bit of a cyber attack for about one minute here. We've just blanked it, period. by chance. Yes. You know, I, I actually got it right. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I think uh, our campaign has actually been used to this at this point, so this is not new. It's unfortunate, but It's perfectly fine, Karen. Thank you. I appreciate it. This is not easy work for the club to do. It takes a lot of time and effort to organize these things. So thank you. Um, okay, so to address the question. Um, so the question was, what would I do to get the word out? So there's two things that I've uh, committed to. The first was, if, if elected, um, I, I would really like to prioritize two things. The first is, I would like to have a physical presence, obviously in Allegheny County, uh, a physical office that's centrally located for a lot of people to be able to access. I would also like to have an office that's present in Westmoreland County, a physical presence. I don't think that having um, satellite offices is enough. Uh, right now, I think that given the offices located in East Liberty, there are people in this district to have, that have to drive 45 to 50 minutes to be able to reach uh, services there. So that's, I think, a big part of it. The second thing is, as somebody who serves on local council and has worked in county government, I have, a, and, and as well as the work that I've done through my civic tech um, work, I have a deep appreciation for um, our local elected officials and our state legislators. I would like to convene, I would say, maybe monthly or bi-monthly meetings to be able to have uh, our state legislators, and our, including our state house members and our state senators at a table and trying to get a sense of some of the key issues uh, and, and, and the challenges that are happening on the ground. Serving at the federal level, you're not, it's a very large district. It's roughly 700,000 people. You're not going to have the ability to get a sense of what's happening on the ground. So a big responsibility that I would have is to take my points and take guidance from local elected officials to drive that home. Oh. There's been some allegations made that you've been taking money 
from mega Republican donors. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, there's been some sense, at least being reported, that you've been taking money, receiving money from mega Republican donors like Mr. Yass. Can you address that? Thank you for that question. Um, so I'd like to just start off by saying I've been a Democrat my entire life. Um, I believe in reproductive justice. I think it's absolutely critical that a woman has a right to choose and control uh, her health care access. It's absolutely critical that we advocate for gun violence prevention, create good paying union jobs, invest in vocational training. I was a Joe Biden delegate for the 2020 Democratic National Convention, and I've stayed with him since he got elected. And I think it's absolutely critical that we do not hedge on supporting him. Unequivocally, democracy is on the line and we have to do everything in our potential to get him reelected. It's really concerning to me that uh, there have been allegations about uh, outside money, Republican money, all of these things that have been mis misinformation has been spread. The information has been made public about our campaign finance reports. That information is documented. You can Google it and you can find it. There was a political article that specifically said that this outside organization, which by the way, we have no control over. We have no control over what these outside organizations do. The $270,000 they're talking about came from people within this community. That was documented by an article in Politico. And to misrepresent that in any other way is wrong. I am committed to advocating and making sure that President Biden and Senator Casey are uh, reelected. Uh, and I think it's important that we recognize that the dangers that people like Jeffrey Ass and Donald Trump represent. Thank you very much, Bhavani, uh, and we apologize for that um, interruption. So this concludes the endorsement meeting. Two things, don't forget to vote from four to nine tonight. The results of the endorsements will be posted on the 14th Ward website and as well as our Facebook page. Again, thank you very much. And I think our fearless leader- I just, I just wanna say, the email will come out at four o'clock. Look in your spam folders. You know, you should have gotten emails from us during the week so you know you're eligible to vote. The voting will close at nine. And please stay around in kibitz and eat this food that we have, right? And I, please stay around and talk. And thanks to all the candidates and everyone who spent the time to learn today. Thank you.